Band. Tony Sheridan was a musician, singer, composer <coughs> in Hamburg. And he uh, did a wonderful song called uh, uh, My Body Lies Over the Ocean. Okay, and that song, the Beatles uh, covered the song with music. So that was their first report. They, they, they put out an album, Tony Sheridan and the Beatles. Yeah, well, the Beatles are really just in the back. Yeah, in 64 or something like that. Yeah, they did a little work together. Yes? Hi, Tom from Chestnut Hill. Uh, do um, Paul and Ringo know about the book, and when was the last time you, you spoke to them? I saw Paul in person at the White House a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, we were at a uh, ceremony honoring him by the Library of Congress. And uh, we got together, and I'll tell you, we, we had a big hug and uh, talked to Ringo last time about three years ago. Uh, they're both very reclusive. Uh, Ringo's more reclusive. Paul's out there, but Paul lives in a bubble. So when you're in his bubble, let's say you take pictures for him, you know, you're taking backstage pictures, you don't leave without him seeing the pictures. He's very controlled. But you know, he has the ability to be in control. Uh, so I asked him about the book. He said, you know, Larry, you, you were there just telling me. And uh, I said, you sure? And then we're supposed to get together in Philadelphia at the Four, at the four Seasons, but it never happened. I talked to his people. He talks through them. Uh, the interesting thing is about all the inter early interviews I did with them from 1964 and 65, they tell so much about their early lives that I didn't even know about. I didn't even use any of them material. So for example, I have tape from 64 where Paul says, Larry, my dad told me you'll never make a living with a guitar. You've got to get a day job. And he kept telling me, don't do this. It's not going to work out. You've got to have a real job. And, we, and Lennon talking about the little in town hall and Ringo talking about his beginning. So I have plenty of plenty of material. That night, by the way, a little news story for you. I reported on my show that Joe Sestak, running for the U.S. Senate, claimed the White House offered him a job to get out of the race against our own inspector, and it became a big story. So Sean Hannity from Fox, who is more, as you know, an opinion guy rather than a reporter, called me up and said, can you come on the air uh, to talk to me about that interview. I said, yeah, but I'm not going to comment on it. I'm just going to tell you what happened. So I was in Washington, ready to go to this event at the White House. And he did the interview with me the night before I was invited to the White House. I get to the White House for this concert, and there's only about 80 people. And uh, they had uh, Emmy Lou Harris, and uh, uh, Seinfeld was there. Uh, they had uh, the woman who did Monday Night Football, Faith Hill, some other artists, the, the Jonas Brothers for the young people. Um, and the president was there. Anyway, the end of the concert, Paul comes up to me, gives me a big hug, we talk, and uh, Rahm Emanuel, the White House Chief of Staff, who's not a really nice guy, walks up to me and says, are you the reporter? He's got his wife with him, who, who, who's reporting on the Sestak story. I said, yeah. And he said, you are so-and-so blank, blank, dead at the White House. So I said, well, you know, I would consider that a really inappropriate statement to make from the chief of staff of the leader of the free world at a social function, so that's fine. <laughs> McCartney comes over to me, he says, who is he? I said, he's the chief of staff of the White House. And I don't know why he said this, does he know who you are? <laughs> like he was making me bigger than I was. And uh, anyway, Rob Emanuel eventually apologized. Yes? Um, I heard stories and read a lot of Beatle books that um, John and George were very good practical jokers. Do you have any stories like on the road of practical jokes they pulled? Yeah, that's in my first book, Ticket to Ride. They, uh, the two of them were an absolute menace. Uh, <laughs> the biggest problem I had in the, in the tours is I would be trying to sleep late at night because I worked 24 hours. Uh, whenever I got to where I got to, they could sleep for a few hours. I had to do my reports for the morning. Um, he would, his biggest deal with me was mashed potatoes and peas. And they would try to sprinkle the mashed potatoes through my hair, drop ice down the back of my shirt, uh, and then have pillow fights and they try to smother me. And uh, so Paul didn't do much of that. Uh, Paul would just wake you up and just say there's a fire or something like that. Uh, and George, of course, uh, you know, didn't like flying at all. But we had a lot of fun on the plane. 
I did beat Lenin in a pillow fight one night. And I did it with the help of the Righteous Brothers. They were there, one of their opening acts. And they're two, they're not brothers, but they're, one of them's gone. But they, uh, we, we, we beat them pretty badly. I just didn't want to hurt them. Uh, it was a very, very interesting uh, group of people. Yes. Now I have two questions. One is, uh, when you were on the road with the Beatles, the stories that you were doing, that was just for the, your local? No. I was a, the same station I told you about that I work for, uh, get the call letters by WFUN, <laughs> Fun. Uh, Fun in the Sun, the Mighty 790 in Miami. What they did was they syndicated my reports all across the country. Except in those days, you, had, you did not have technology to, to get the reports to them, so you can't, couldn't mail it to them. So today, I can do an interview on my iPhone or a commentary for KYW and just mail it to them. It's unbelievable. In those days, you had to take the phone, open it up. They were circular phones, okay? You would open up, and by the way, this is illegal, or was illegal, and inside the phone, you would find two nodules, metal nodules. You would then take alligator clips from, and from the tape recorder, and you'd feed it that way. Now, the reason that was illegal is that's how a lot of bookies used to try to, to relay the results of racetrack action for gamblers. So I had it in every room I was in, I had to take it apart and do that. And, uh, and reports were on 50 stations, including WIBG in Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah. My second question is, earlier you said that uh, when you first met them, you know, here in September, going by November, musically, when did you know that they were going to be what they Well, became? my musical ear is not very sensitive. But I saw 77 concerts of the Beatles, which may be more than anybody in the world except them, of course. And uh, what happened was, about four or five days into it, I was starting to feel the music. And it was very interesting because I will tell you something about the Beatles that very few people know. The Beatles' stage presence, and all you have to do is watch their appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show, have you ever seen, you've seen that, right? That tape tells you everything you need to know about their performance. Because what they did, if, you, if for example, a couple of years ago, the Rolling Stones did the Super Bowl, and they were horrible. They could, they just couldn't keep a tune, right? And maybe it's because it was live. You know, maybe when they do their concerts, they have so much sound you can't really hear how bad they are right now. And the Beatles were almost perfect. So what you saw in a concert when you listened to Paul singing, I saw her standing there, which they rarely did on, uh, in their tours, by the way. Or if you heard Paul doing Golly Miss Molly or Twist and Shout. And by the way, Twist and Shout, which is always viewed as a Beatles song, is not a Beatles song. But they, they immortalized the song. Uh, it, was, it was from the Isley Brothers. And whenever they did a song, when you can stand there, and you know, your ears are so, the, the, the sound of the crowd was like a jet noise. You had to put your, pull your ears, ears forward. Whenever you could hear them, they were perfect. I mean, perfect. They didn't miss a beat except at Shea Stadium because they couldn't see or hear each other because of the craziness there. But they had to actually redo the, the track for the album. Uh, so they were very good. And, and, you know, they had, if you look at it, over 1,270 concerts over four years prior to their success. What else? Yes. How are you going to preserve? Are you preserving the tapes? And yeah, the tapes. What are you going to do with you, like in December? You were all the tapes that I have are uh, on uh, DVD, and they're uh, locked up. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I'm not going to sell them. All right, I'm not going to sell them because uh, I think they're too valuable to sell. You want to buy them? Tell <laughs> 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 I have great conviction about that. But uh, no, I, I, I'm trying to actually collect everything now. There's other, one other thing that's interesting about the tapes I have. I have tapes I have that I don't have. Okay. So what I find is that more and more I find these, uh, these uh, albums coming from Germany and other places with my interviews on them. So I have interviews I've done that I don't even have because there were so many. Is there somebody over here? Yes. How do you feel uh, how John Lennon died? Well, it's horrible. I mean, here was a guy who... Uh, as I said, would walk up to you in a minute to say hello. He used to go to a park near Allentown with his son, trying to get out of the city. 
he went to move when he was uh, dating May Pang. You know, May Pang was his girlfriend was fixed up with him, with him by his wife, and uh, it was a very bad scene. They were really in love with each other, and when he lived with her on the east side of Manhattan, he would go to movies, he would go to cafes, he would walk the streets. He loved New York, so you know. When somebody would come up to him, it was part of his routine. And uh, unfortunately, a, uh, a killer came, and that was it. Very upset. Yes? There's a lot of uh, lurid information about John Lennon's relationship with Susan Sutcliffe. Didn't he die from a brain hemorrhage? Is there an indication of violence? Yeah, this, it's actually uh, part of the last book I wrote. Uh, John, Stu Sutcliffe uh, was beaten up several times. The first time was by a group of what they called Teddy Boys. They were what we would describe in the 1950s as juvenile delinquents, just ruffians. Uh, it was at a concert, and uh, the boys, actually, Carnegie sort of rescued him along with John. The second time, when he quit the band, John beat him up. But there's no real evidence to point to uh, John's beating as having <coughs> anything to do with that, although it's possible. He was caught What was the last thing he said? There's no. No clear, confirmed, forensic evidence to indicate that John's beating had anything to do with this death. But his sister, Stu's sister, is convinced that it might have contributed. But you just never know. Also, as far as Pete Best, the conventional uh, press account of Pete Best is that his drumming must have been out of control because he was beaten up because he was drumming too much. Well, that's not true. The fact is that every, both Pete Best and Ringo, were replaced at recording sessions. Oh, okay. In fact, on Love Me Do, uh, what's those things you hit that make noise? Sizzles. No. Uh, the, the maracas. What's that? Maracas. 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 Ringo played the maracas on Love Me Do. Oh, okay. And they brought in a session drummer. Uh, so, you know, you can't say, if you listen to Pete Best today, he's 72 or whatever. He's not as good as he was, <laughs> but he was a hell of a drummer. He played the Sars Volcano? Yep. Yeah. He's a, you know, tough life to be replaced and be part of a group and see that group go. Interesting story, by the way. Neil Aspinall, who had the baby with Pete's mother, uh, with the day that Pete was fired, they had a drink. And, and Neil said, I'm quitting too. I'm leaving them. He was the master of getting them in and out of places. Just a very good businessman. He ran their empire until he died a few years ago. Uh, and Pete said to him, he said, you stay with that band because they're going to be big and it's going to change your life. Tremendous level of unselfishness. And uh, you know, when, when you read the way that came down, it's pretty, pretty emotional. Anybody else? Yes. Do you happen to know the words to all the songs and do no. you ever sing them? <laughs> no, I do know, uh, I knew all their songs. Yeah. <clears throat> I have certain favorites. Do you sing them to no. yourself? I know, I can't sing. Uh, I mean, I have a problem with uh, 45,000 people singing the national anthem. I mean, uh, uh, no, I, I, I do. I have a almost four year old grandson here who's totally, and I say, John, he says, Paul, I say, George, he says, Ringo. He, says, uh, uh, he loves the music. And, uh, you know, what's not to like? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I never got to see any of the Beatles personally, but my late father, God rest his soul, in 1986, in the Radio City Music Hall, we actually got to see John Lennon's oldest son, Julian Lennon, in person. When he was singing, I'll repeat it. his voice sounded just like his late father's. My father turned to me and said, oh my God, did the ghost of John Lennon just come back alive? Yeah, it's interesting. You said uh, Julian Lennon's had an unusual career because he sounds, sounds just, just like, like his father. He sounds just like him. His voice sounds like him. And he really hasn't pursued an aggressive career. And he owns a restaurant, I think, in London uh, or, the, or in Spain or somewhere. Um, he's very close to his mom. Uh, I've never met him. Uh, I did meet uh, the other son, Sean. Uh, Yoko likes me. I don't know what the deal is, but uh, I guess she considers me a younger man, and uh, you know, she just turned 80, and we have a nice relationship. She's actually a very different person than people think. <laughs>